All right, so I'm really excited to be joined by Josh Roper today in an interview that we're going to be doing here on Trials Progression Channel. So Josh, thanks so much for joining us. And uh, I wanna start out just with a quick, funny story. The first time I ever uh, saw you interact with you, I was a checker three years ago at Wildwood. So you were riding a national, I was in section eight on Sunday. So on top of like this cliff, so it was, it was like 20 feet down. The first ride I come up was Sam Fassel, and he was getting ready to cut across this section. And I, as a checker, didn't really know where I was going to be, and I was going to move forward. And you just kind of put your hand like right on my chest to say, like, no, no, stay back. He's about to go that way because I had no clue where he was going to go. And so you put your hand right there, and I grabbed your hand. And we're on the edge of this cliff, and I didn't want to fall backwards. And I was just holding your hand for like a little too long, you know. And eventually, you're just kind of like you like shook it off, like, okay, checker, like go away. I'm ready to That's watch the buddy. rest of the section. Was that yes. in Ohio? Yeah, that was in Ohio. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So think, that was my first you know, interaction with you. And uh, we've been, you know, I mean, in my mind, I just thought I got to hold Josh Roper's hand. I think, uh, you know, I think we were coming up like this, you know, as a right hand turn, steep hill yep. through this yep. crevice and like up a rock. And yeah, exactly. I, I do remember that. Yep. I do yeah, remember that section. Memory. I had a 360 camera mounted on my head so I could record and hopefully uh, still pay yeah. attention as a checker. So what yeah. an awesome experience. That was my first ever trial watching. But uh, cool. anyway, I'm really excited to, to talk with you. We just uh, released a creek riding video from our time at Trials Training Center, and uh, that was just a lot of fun. And I sure appreciate your willingness to, to work with me in this channel and uh, help other people learn more about trials. Oh, definitely. Yeah, it's awesome to be on here and hopefully... Uh, provide some good content for everybody and uh, i mean essentially hopefully everybody gets better at trials by the end of the day <laughs> yeah right on right on so uh we got to ride it at ttc and while we were there there were some hard enduro guys that were riding and one of them came over and i was uh letting him try out my bike and explaining hey this is the number two guy in the united states check out what he's doing i think you were hopping on the back wheel and stuff and so we were just kind of explaining to that gentleman the benefit of trials for hard enduro riders. Uh, go ahead and if you don't mind, talk to us a little bit about what you've seen as it relates to, you know, some time and in, in enduro cross and hard enduro and, and those skills that seem to be very um, much of a crossover. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, take, I'm just going to start out by saying take all the top hard enduro riders now and look at their background, look where they came from. You know, Cody Webb, he came from a Charles background, Billy Bolt, um, you know, there's the list goes on and on, but um, all of them come from that Charles background. And the Charles just teaches you all that clutch for auto body weight, uh, braking control all into one. And you can apply that to the big bike and it makes it easier for, uh, you know, when you go out and do the hard enduros. So. Yeah, for sure. So I, I thought it'd be interesting today to talk a little bit about your trials experience and also some of how you've started to dabble into the hard enduro world as well. Uh, so for you, as you were starting out as a, a young uh, rider, which came first? Was it a trials bike or a, a full-size dirt bike? It's been trials my whole entire life. Okay. Well, I kind of take that back. It's It's been trials my entire life, but my very first dirt bike was a little Honda 50. Uh -huh. and uh i have a cool photo of that actually on on christmas day and uh and so yeah it's just it's been a honda 50 then after that i think that's when Osset just released their bikes and so i was able to get one of those and uh you know the list goes on like slowly progressing 50 80 125 and so on or whatever i actually skipped 250 i went straight from 125 to 300 but um you know very first bike actually was a dirt bike but continued to ride trials on it i rode the beginner line at our local club in uh on the little honda 50. Uh -huh. and where did you grow up josh so i grew up in phoenix arizona right in the middle of the city um and so whenever we went riding we always had to travel a little bit going out there and uh and basically we just had the desert to ride which was it was awesome yeah and who were you riding with primarily growing up so growing up i uh trials actually wasn't really a main focus of mine i kind of like dabbled here and there with different sports like i did soccer and i did basketball and golf and tennis and wrestling and stuff so i did all that and it wasn't until my sophomore year of high school i got a phone call from brad baumart saying that you know we want you to focus on trials more and so they helped me through a deal and everything and um ever since sophomore year of high school it's been just trials ever since 
Awesome. Awesome. And you were riding with what your brother and your dad? Yep. So I was riding with my brother, uh, you know, growing up, I rode with my brother and then my dad would also come out as well. And then, um, once sophomore year hit, well, freshman year, sophomore year, you know, still riding and everything. Daniel Blancanet came to work at, um, at my dad's business as an engineer. And so part of that deal was, uh, he would work there and then he also two times a week got to go out and go ride. So I'd be done with school load. Uh, you know, I check his tire pressure. I fill up his bikes. I check his air filter, grab his keys from his truck because I didn't have a truck at the time. Uh, bring his truck around back, uh, check all those things, make sure everything's ready to go load up his gear, load up. I mean, I did everything for Daniel. It's funny. We, we laugh about this. It's funny. And, uh, load up the bikes basically went in there was like daniel you ready to go and uh you know he'd be like sweet yeah let's go and then we go off and ride so we did that for uh quite some time and uh basically my whole entire high school and so uh yeah it was awesome so i've gotten to ride with a whole different mix of people and when i was younger brian was at uh reaching the pro level so he's really able to come help me and uh help with all my basics yeah so now we do need to take a quick pause and talk about your brother because did I see he's making a return to the uh, pro class? Talk to us about that. I was very curious to see his name. He again. is. He is. Uh, he is coming back. I think he's only doing select rounds. So Brian came out to the first round of the STRA event this year down in Florida uh, in early March, I think it was, and uh, he came out just you know practice one time beforehand and. Well, he just about uh, he just about beat us, and he was hanging hanging in right there. So he definitely still has the ability. You know, he took a I think five five or more year break from trials. You know, didn't have a bike for a while, and so came on back. And you know, his skills are still there. And watching him ride, and I'm like, yep, you are still very capable of riding pro. So you know, Brian is he's one of the most competitive people I know, and so uh, I think he'll do really good. And you know, it's just exciting to have. You know, the pro class is pretty stacked right now uh, going into Arizona. So it'll be good. I'm excited. Yeah, yeah that's probably, is there more pros riding this year than any previous year? See, I think I've seen eight on the list signed up, eight or nine. And so I think it'll be really cool. And uh, spoiler alert, now we got Toby coming over. That's right, Toby Martin. Yep. And you, have you ridden with him before internationally? Yeah, yeah I've ridden with him internationally. And... Uh, you know, he's, he's a super nice guy, super down to earth. I mean, super friendly. So, um, he's a really good guy to compete with. And so I'm, I'm actually excited to have him over here and I think he'll really enjoy it. So Josh, that's awesome to hear about your experience. And I want to take a moment just to talk about how you're giving back to the sport. Uh, you said that when you were growing up, you were attending, you know, a youth camp and Brad Bomber had done a lot. Talk to us now about how you're helping some of the younger riders as well. Yeah, definitely. So I'll, start out with uh, the team camp. So I have been going to that team camp. Well, hold on. Let me say my mom has been going to that team camp and helping out like she cooked for everybody. And so she's been doing that since let's say 2008 or nine. And so my first year at TTC being able to ride the youth nationals was probably 2009, I think. And I was on a little sugar 50, Churko 50. And you all know something crazy, actually. Pat Smodgy mined it for me that year. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so that was my first year doing that. And so ever since then, pretty much every single year from 2009 all the way till present, I've been at every single team camp. I might have missed one or two. Um, last year, I couldn't do it because I was injured. But um, I was there for just a, a day or two. But anyways, um, yeah, so I've been going up there, doing team camp. So I've been growing up doing all that for a very long time and then fast forward to a couple of years ago brad bomber was the original guy who started it he came over and approached uh let's see carl nigel and i and i think daniel might have been there as well i was like hey uh, i'm no longer going to be a part of the team camp um i would like for you guys to run it and so we took the initiative to go ahead and run that and so not only did we set up the, all the youth national sections for everybody but then uh we also s continued on the you know we could call it a legacy of team camp and so ever since then you know uh myself nigel uh and 
Cole Collins have also helped out a whole bunch as well on getting team camp rolling. And so uh, we're going to do it again this year. Awesome. Awesome. I think that's so special that the sport of trials has these, these professionals as mentors to helping the younger kids. And I just appreciate your humility to give back to the sport. And everyone's just been so approachable as I've been getting into the sport. So for anyone who doesn't know a professional rider, if you see one, talk to them. They are very <laughs> down to earth and I'm sure uh, they would enjoy speaking with you as well. Yep. So Josh, let's, uh, let's, let's come a little bit closer in time frame of your journey to this last year. Uh, your game has really been stepping up and uh, being number two in the United States, you're definitely chasing after Pat Smaji. So can you talk to us a little bit about that rivalry and uh, that competitiveness? You said he was a minder for you way back when, and now you're, you're challenging him uh, on that podium. Yeah. So I just want to start out by saying, uh, you know, Pat is one of my closest friends that I've ever competed with. And so, you know, I look back at the history that we have together and I actually remember a time when he came to my soccer games when, uh, when I was a kid. So that was some, that was something super special to have, you know, Pat Smodgy come and watch me play soccer. And so it was cool, you know, it was way back when, and then you fast forward to now and, you know, we're, we're competing against each other now. And, and so it's actually a, it's an honor to compete against him. He has, so much success in the sport of trials and um you know he is so good he is a tough cookie to crack so um i enjoy competing against him you know pat is a very humble guy and that's something that i really admire about him especially how much how many championships he has and stuff and so it's really awesome to see that and you know I, it, every time i get to compete against him it's just i have a smile on my face and this last year, I, t I forgive my ignorance, I don't remember, and I don't have it in front of me. How did you compare to him? Did you beat him in some rounds? Yep. So in Florida, the first round, I beat him the first day. And then the second day, he beat me. I had a stupid five on this hillside and ended up going over the bars. And uh, it was on my last loop. I had like four sections to go. And when that happened, uh, Nigel and I kind of both knew it. We're kind of bummed out a little bit, but uh, that's okay. And then going into Colorado, he beat me both days. Uh, then the first day in Oregon, he beat me. And then the second day in Oregon, I finally beat him again. So, and we tied both days in Oregon too. And he got me on cleans, I'm pretty sure. Oh, no, sorry. He got me because of where I was the first person to dab. And then he dabbed later on. So uh, that was on the first day. Then the second day, we tied again, and I beat him on cleans. And then Rhode Island, uh, a very nasty, sloppy event, super slick. He just completely annihilated us. I mean, he was on a whole nother level compared to everybody else in the pro class. And it was very respectable. Yeah, that was a pretty high-scoring event. So uh <laughs> Definitely, definitely was challenging. But congrats on on beating Pat. That must have been uh, <laughs> some awesome celebration to to be able to come so far. Yep, yeah, it was definitely something very special, and uh, I'll never forget the first time that I beat him was back in 2022 at the uh, California Trials Invitational, and uh, it was very close between him and I, and uh, came down to the very last section, and it was a pretty tricky section, and. Uh, you know, ended up getting, getting through it and with a clean and then, uh, and then I just remembered, I remember going down a hill on my way up to do the last obstacle and being like, oh my gosh, like this could happen. You know, you always dream of the day of that happening, but then when you're actually living in the moment and it's about to happen, it's a whole nother feeling. It's just like all these nerves just go straight to you. And so trying to manage all those was was pretty difficult but at the end of the day you know uh was able to clean the section uh you know rev my bike up throw it on the ground give Nigel a big old hug and so that was a super memorable day and maybe I can send that video off to you you're going over right now Josh Roper going for it
right. So switching gears a little bit here, Josh, uh, you've been riding a big bike as well. Uh, for those of the, in the viewing audience who might be considering riding uh, hard enduro, or maybe they ride trials to get better at hard enduro, I'd like to to switch gears here and uh, talk a little bit about that. So, how did you get into riding a uh, a larger motorcycle? Yeah, so it was actually back in 2021. I purchased my first dirt bike, which was a Beta. Um, a little bit before that, throughout all throughout high school, I was working at a motorcycle shop, and we were primarily a Beta dealer. So I knew a lot, I know a lot about the Beta Enduro bikes and, and the Charles bikes. And so fast forward about a year later, I finally purchased my own dirt bike and it was just for fun, just enjoy it, uh, just to cruise around and everything. And then uh, it was super cool to ride that and then eventually got rid of that. And it wasn't until I hopped on with Gas Gas and was able to ride a Gas Gas dirt bike. And so first year, kind of rode one here and there, did uh did like two rounds of the enduro cross and that was pretty fun really enjoyed that and then um and you know not, never really rode it or anything and so uh never rode it on a moto track it was just for fun to go out and go do try something different and then you know that goes on for another year or so then last year was kind of my my first time actually riding and kind of training on an enduro bike and I was training for the enduro cross season and, um, and so, yeah, so I've just been riding the, uh, the dirt bike and trying to get it ready and trying to get fit on the enduro bike. Cause it's a whole different type of fitness, you know, enduro cross is by far the most tiring thing you'll ever do. One lap will have your heart rate from, you know, resting heart rate to max 180 real quick and arm pump. <laughs> So what, what did that training look like? Were you working with a coach or just with a, another peer or what, how did you prepare for that? Yeah. So I was able to ride with some people down in Arizona, um, you know, Cooper Abbott and Max Gersten. And so I was able to ride with them on their enduro cross track and we just do simulate some races and do some intervals. So you do, I don't know, uh, two or three laps and then you sit for a little bit, then do two or three more or whatever. Um, and then over in California, I was able to ride with Cole. He was doing the enduro crosses as well. And so got to ride with Tristan who actually won the enduro cross, uh, series this past year. So that was pretty fun to ride with him. And, um, you got to ride with Spencer Wilton and, uh, Will Riordan and Ryder LeBlanc. So you got to ride with all these different riders and, um, it's just super cool to ride with them, watch what they're doing, studying what they're doing. And yeah, it was super enjoyable. And do you feel that a lot of the techniques carried right over or was there things that you were like, Oh gosh, I need to quickly learn such and such. So the thing that I found out is you got to be able to jump something in a door across. So that's my biggest thing. You know, us trials riders, we don't like to jump and especially like these sketchy log tire doubles in enduro cross are they're super sketchy uh at least to me maybe not to other people but uh you know i'm not a jumper uh like this i'd much rather hit a nice groomed perfectly you know dirt jump whatever and so uh being able to jump something in enduro cross will save you so much time and as far as the technical ability like is able to go through the rocks and everything just fine, but it's all the in-between bits that you got to go fast in. And so that's what I'm not used to. And being able to have that intensity for four minutes plus one or six minutes plus one, you know? Yeah. So what are your favorite parts about riding uh, a big bike? Um, well, surprisingly enough, the (laughs) airtime, I hate the sketchy jumps, but I love the airtime. I love to jump mountain bikes, love to do all that, love to go to the moto track and jump, but jumping and duro cross jumps is just something completely different um but i just enjoy the reward at the end that you get after doing an enduro cross race and doing well the racing aspect is like nothing else it's not like you know riding trials where it's just you in the section you know you're lining up against 12 12 other riders and you're going head to head i mean you're banging bars you're uh all on the starting gate and you're getting trying to get the whole shot and um it's it's fun i love the the feeling that you get right before you're getting ready to start yeah it seems like a massive adrenaline dump 
It is. It is. So Josh, you mentioned a lot of the, the fitness and the intensity of Enduro Cross. And I know even from Trials Training Center, I offered you a granola bar and you were like reading the instructions to see how much sugar it had in it. So I know that you're more conscientious of your nutrition than, than I am, obviously. And to ride at that level that you do in Trials and Enduro Cross, I imagine you have to be. Do you mind telling us a little bit about uh, your nutrition habits and any exercise programs or lifting or what you do to, to stay in shape? Yeah, definitely. Um you know, I'll admit it right away. Nutrition and nutrition is probably my worst enemy. Um, I love sugar, but, uh, I just went, I just recently went on a, on a pretty strict diet. And so it's been, it's been amazing. And so I'm trying to stay, I'm trying to stay true to that. And, uh, you know, I've always watched kind of like what I put in my body and stuff. And so, um, sometimes the, the donuts really get the best of me sometimes, but you know, um, it's, you got to find foods that you can, uh, that produce energy for your body throughout the event. So for example, uh, in between loops, I'm going to have an apple because it's a great source of energy or a banana or something like that. And so, uh, whenever I'm riding or training, I'm always trying to have fruits and vegetables and um, you know, whenever it comes dinner time, replace that with some protein and some veggies and, um, all of those, you'll start to, you'll start to feel a difference in your training in your energy levels, whenever you're riding, you know, uh, Jared Becker, he, uh, he works at this gym that I was going to out in, in Phoenix. He owns it. And I'll never forget. He told me this. He goes, if you couldn't eat it 2000 years ago you probably shouldn't eat it now. Hmm. So all your fruits and vegetables and your meat and your chicken, whatever you could eat that 2000 years ago. But you know, you look at all these processed foods nowadays, everything that goes through a factory, like all that is not the best, not the healthiest for you. So try and think of that, trying to think of that in uh, that sense is if you could eat it back then, then uh, you should probably be eating it now. Yeah, I think that's a, a good, simple way of looking at it. So what about exercise? Are you hitting the gym? Are you doing cardio? Is it mostly time on the bike? Or how do you how do you stay fit? Yep, so I would go about 70, 70% of it is spent on, on the time with the bike because that's something you can't just go around. You can't skip that part. Um, not only that, but you also get every time you do spend time on the bike, you're getting exercise, you're building your, uh, your cardio system. And, um, then I'd say the other 30% goes to stretching or, uh, putting the bicycle on the trainer or lifting weights. Um, I'm not, I haven't been lifting weights a whole bunch recently, but I've been on the, on the bicycle trainer and, and stretching and stuff. And so, uh, the more flexible you can be and the more time you have spent on the bike is is all around going to make you a better rider and you'll see it transfer over i think i heard someone talking about the difference between the expert class and the pro class just being the size of the hits like the they're massive i i, I remember watching you guys drop off of rocks and go up rocks and it just seemed like if you're not having a tight core if you're not physically fit this is going to beat you down you're not going to be able to last that many laps so yeah uh, I, I i think i imagine that how physically fit you have to be going from one level to the next is, is extreme. Yep. So it's you, the biggest thing is like practicing intervals, right? So even though your, your whole entire, well, we'll just call it a workout, your whole entire workout, your eight hours of riding a whole entire trial, you're going to have 32 intervals of a minute and a half. So if you can replicate a minute and a half intervals of going hard, going fast for that long, and then you can rest for a little bit. Do that 32 times, and that's how you can help simulate a whole entire trial. That's good. I actually had someone uh, asking briefly in the creek riding video, any tips on reducing arm pump and also how to handle that? Uh, and I know you were stretching, and it was it was a lot going through that creek. Any advice on arm pump? Yeah, definitely. So I'll tell you this. Uh, my Arm pump in enduro cross is unlike anything else you'll ever feel. Uh, arm pump in trials is just a little different. I mean, I've been riding trials for so long. The more time you spend on the bike, the 
the arm pump will eventually go away and stuff. And so, uh, the biggest thing that you can, you can do is if you start to get arm pump, you know, stretch out your fingers, stretch out each individual one, then all of them, uh, kind of massage your forearm. You can use the end of the bar to massage your forearm a little bit, the bottom side and the top. And hopefully that'll help massage your muscles, allowing it to expand a little bit more. Well, thanks for that little tip. Uh, let's talk for a moment about risk management, uh, trials versus enduro cross. I, I imagine one is a lot more risky and you can't necessarily get hurt and jeopardize a trials uh, career and season. So how do, how do you approach each of those aspects and any advice for, you know, a lot of the viewing audience is like 50 to 60 year old guys that probably shouldn't yeah. be taking huge risks. Uh, so talk to us a little bit about risk management and how you think through whether you should hit something or if you're fatigued or that type of stuff. Yeah. So last year, the enduro cross schedule kind of fell in line after the trial season. So the trial season is obviously primary season and then the draw cross season was then so i was like okay i'll go try that so um i knew if i got injured i could have some time to heal before the next season and stuff and so you know trials you're going a lot slower you have time to react you have a minder up there you know nigel gives me just that two seconds of extra time to you know kind of spot my landing if i'm falling off a rock or you know everything's just happening so much slower enduro cross on the other hand when you look at it, you're racing, you're in a race, you're trying to jump stuff, you're trying to go through the rocks as fast as you can, so the intensity is very high, your the speeds are higher, so your reaction time to bail out if you were to crash is all significantly less. So risk management is a lot more important in endurocross, and coming from a trials background, we're all timid to, you know, huck ourselves at these gigantic you know jumps and so that was one thing i always struggled with doing the enduro cross season was just to turn off the brain and just send it so um there is a couple of times i i was forced to do it if i wanted to do good and so uh you know you just th huck yourself at it and just pray you live to see another day <laughs> so Jeez. that's uh that's one way to put it but yeah. Now, do you guys, are you walking the track or do you actually get to do any test laps on it for enduro cross? Yep. So we'll walk the track in the morning and then we'll have a free practice and we'll have a time practice. And then that time practice determines our starting order for our heats. And then our heats, if you, if you do, if you qualify in your heats, then you make it to the night show. And then there's one more free practice and then the night show. And so you get, you know, a fair amount of time on the track it doesn't feel like a whole lot when you actually race it but you get a you get a pretty pretty decent amount to inspect and watch other people yeah yeah and then you also did a uh hard enduro the tko right to share with us a little bit about your experience there yeah so the tko that was a this it's a story so uh you know it's my very first hard enduro and so i've been training for it just i didn't have too long to train for it maybe a week or two, which is not nearly enough time to be able to race a hard enduro. And so TKO is a little bit more fast paced. So it didn't really suit my style. It wasn't as technical. So you have your hot lap that you race and the top 16 go into a straight rhythm section. And I just missed out on that straight rhythm section by 0.1 seconds to Quinn Wenzel. So that was a little uh. bit of a bummer. And, you know, I made a mistake here in my hot lap and I was like, dang, that was the that was the difference right there. So I almost got into the, the straight rhythm, which is super cool. Um, you just go head to head racing down the, down the logs at TTC. And then you do after that, you do your or the next day, I should say you do your TKO race one. And then that determines your starting order for TKO race two. And it's just a knockout every, you know, it's just a knockout. So some riders get cut. So then I made it to TKO race two, or, let me start with TKO race one. It was good. Uh, it was about a little over an hour long for my, at my pace. I think the top guys did it in, in the on low 40s, I think, maybe 30s. And so I was about an hour to finish TKO race one, and it was pretty good. And then, uh, you know, it felt fine and everything. The energy was good, no cramping. And then TKO race two, each race gets significantly harder. And 
and you know we got some we got to some hard bits and that's when you know i made it 75 percent of the way and that's when the cramping started to kick in kick in Ooh. and so part of that was because i i didn't realize how much after racing tico race one i thought it was going to be similar to that i didn't think it was going to be nearly as long it was just going to be just like tico race one which was a big mistake and so i didn't have any electrolytes in my back in my bag so I had just water and, you know, we're just racing, racing through the woods, through the creeks and everything. It was everything fine. Got 75% of the way through, reached to this point. Nigel was there and everything. And my body just started to cramp. You know, I couldn't feel my forearms, my back, my legs. And I'm trying to push my way through this rock garden and it's super gross. It's nasty. And finally I get through it and, you know, we have about, three to five more miles a single track and the whole entire time i'm just cramping you know forearms triceps every muscle group that you can name was just completely cramping anytime i tried to sit down my hamstrings were cramped it was awful it was terrible could not move and uh you know then we go back up the creek and then we go through the field and eventually finish and when we finish i just i just go straight back to the pits and just immediately start throwing hammer nutrition products in me, the Endurolite Extremes, the gels and the Perpetuum. And I had taken all the gels with me on my bike. Nigel had strapped some on there. So I'd been popping them left and right, but still I should have had more in the bag uh, to be able to take. And so I'm actually going to race TKO again this year. So actually I'm, I'm planning on doing it. Uh, nothing's been kind of confirmed yet or anything, but I want to. And uh, so I can apply all of this that I learned from last year's to next year's to help race that again and hopefully do better. Awesome. And then does gas gas assist with the, uh, this endeavor? I mean, are you, you're sponsored by them. So they help you with the bike and the pits and all that stuff goes hand in hand or are you on your own? Yep. So they're very supportive and they're, they're able to help me, you know, uh, Nigel is the official mechanic for, gas gas off-road and the trials in off-road and so he's there to help will reorden which just got signed this year and so uh when nigel's not with him he can kind of come off to, onto the side a little bit help me up help me out a little bit and um and so it's great so um, still very supportive and um you know it's just racing it's what we like to do and i'm I'm curious why do you think hard enduro is so much more popular than trials it's it's uh it's ridiculous how much more money and time and energy and tv spots uh hard enduro has any insight into why you think that is yeah so it's like it all comes down to the dirt bike world in general like if you look at dirt bikes motocross bikes all that it's significantly more popular than trials bikes and um and so, yeah, I think it's easier for more people to hop on an enduro bike and go ride some, the same single track that Tristan Hart and Cody Webb are riding versus if you look at the trials, you know, somebody's going to go ride, go grab a trials bike and be like, they, they're they like, oh, man, I'd love to do what Tony Bo does or I'd love to do what Adam Raga does, but I know I'll never be there in a million years. Right. I think it gives people, it shines a little bit more light when people see Cody Webb do all the single track and see him go up these hills, like it gives him a little bit of light to be able to like, Oh, I think I can try that. I think I can do the same thing that Cody's doing. And I think that's when hard enduro differs from trials and why it's more popular because people look at trials and be like, Oh, I'll never be able to do that in a million years. And some people look at hard enduro and be like, Oh wow, I could challenge myself. And I think I can get up that hill. And yeah, right to the hard enduro rider. Why should they try trials? What would you say to that particular person? So yeah, like I said, uh, kind of going back to the beginning, the the clutch and throttle control and body positioning that trials teaches you, you can apply that to your dirt bike, and it'll react the exact same. So from your trials bike skills that you learn on there, when you transfer over to the enduro bike, everything will just feel more natural. You'll be able to get over those logs. You'll be able to get those up those hills, up them rocks. You'll be able to, your technique, your technical ability will improve significantly more 
if you ride and practice trials. And I can guarantee you that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, right on. Well, what about the other way around? Would you say that um, any of the trials crowd should try hard enduro? And if so, uh, you know, how does, how does, what advice would you have for them? Oh yeah, definitely. I think everybody should try a mix of the sports. I think it's, I think it's a, uh, it's great to do some cross training because, you know, all the trials people transferring over to the hard enduro, you know, uh, they already have all the skills that they need to be able to get up them obstacles. But then next thing you know, they just need the motocross and intensity speed to be able to handle, handle that. And so, uh, I think it's, in my opinion, I think it's easier to go from a trials ability to a motocross ability than it is for a motocross to go to a trials ability. And just because trials, trials teaches you so much about body control and clutch control and throttle control. And I think there's a lot to be improved there. And so all the moto people wanting to try trials, think of trials as like a improvement to help your big bikes. Cause it will, it will teach you all that. Yeah. Right on. And I, I almost forgot you've done another thing on two wheels, the bicycle trials. I think I've seen some stuff uh, that you've posted and didn't you even compete recently on a, on a bicycle as well? I did. So I did, I've done two, two bicycle trials events now. And so those are super fun. The first one I did was in 2018 and actually Nigel was there for that event as well. And actually I think he beat me at that event too. Um, and so Nigel's really, really good on Charles bicycle, by the way. And so, yeah, it was super fun. You know, Charles bicycle really teaches you precision on hopping because the tires are so small. Everything has to be so fine. And so it's a lot of hopping. It's a lot of power. So being able to jump up something on a bicycle, uh, correlates to jumping up something on a motorcycle, anything a Charles bicycle does, it'll just simulate what a motorcycle does. Just when you have a motor, it makes it a little bit easier versus your legs, you know, riding Charles bicycle, your legs get stronger pedaling the bike, uh, with stronger legs, you can jump higher. And when you jump higher on a motorcycle, you can make it up bigger obstacles. So they all go hand in hand. So if I were to really suggest something to somebody, it was to say, get a Charles bicycle and practice your hopping, practice your balance, practice, uh, your power. It will, it will help you. Well, Josh, I sure appreciate your time. Anything else to uh, share with the trials progression crowd as it relates to moto trials or anything else? Yeah. Uh, anybody looking out there to get a trials bike, you know, uh, I'm serious. Get it and learn your basics. Take a Ryan Young class or come out to next year's trials training center. Uh, yep. Yeah, Ryan yep. Young Trial School. Uh, sign up for one of his classes. Ryan is an amazing teacher. He has taught me everything I need to know about trials and he still has so much to teach me. I just went out with him, you know, about a month ago and, uh, you know, he's a fabulous teacher and learning so much. And so really recommend getting a trials bike, you know, like I said, learn your basics, learn everything. And any moto guy coming into trials, uh, don't be afraid. Like, come talk to us trials people. We are always open. We are always uh, wanting to help people get people involved. And so if you search on Facebook or the internet, I'm sure there's a local club towards you and um, somebody will be more than happy to help you out. Awesome. Well, Josh, I sure appreciate your time. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you so much.